have a look. I'm just going to share this exact link to people because some people struggled to find it last time. I'm just going to share this exact link to people because some people struggled to find it last time. We'll wait about a couple of minutes before we start because I've said six o'clock. We'll have some late comers come in. <laughs> Okay, yeah, people should start to join. I've sent this exact link out because last time some people struggled to find it. Just realised I'm on mute. <laughs> I want the help. Yeah, the stream doesn't seem to be loading very well. Is this on? Is it taking slow? Is it being slow? Sorry. Yeah, it is a bit delayed. Well, I mean, it's normal that there's a delay, but it's like not loading. Oh, OK. All right, well, it's six o'clock. Should we get, should we start? Yeah. OK, so welcome, everybody. Good evening. Welcome to our second talk. This week we have um, Bishop Terry Draney, uh, Middles, uh, Bishop of Middlesbrough. He studied at Cuthbert's College, I think, in Usher, um, ordained as priest in 1975, and later ordained as bishop in 2008, I believe, if that's correct. Oh, more or less. So, <laughs> am I being right so far? I was at St Cuthbert's College for a brief time, and then I actually did all my main training in Spain, uh, at uh, the English College in Valladolid in, in Spain. Lovely. So without further ado, today's topic will be, um, well, talk topic is, I have called you by your name, you are mine. So uh, without further ado, I'll pass it on to Bishop Terry to do the talk. Thank you very much indeed, Flo. Good. So 
you're welcome everybody and it's good to be with you this evening um, I just want to set what I'm going to say into a bit of a context if I may uh, and just give you a just a few quotes from um, first of all from Christus Vivid you know the the document on the um, uh, the synod on um, young people and, and their vocations and then a few uh, from um, Gau uh, Evangelii Gaudium the joy of the gospel um, just to try and put the whole thing into a, a little bit of a context. Um, in, in Christus Vivid, uh, our Holy Father, Pope Francis says, your own personal vocation is a path guiding your many efforts and actions towards service to others. I am a mission on this earth. That is the reason why I'm here in this world. The Lord calls us to share in his work of creation and to contribute to the common good by using the gifts that we have received. But the first thing that we need to discern, he says, and to discover is this. Jesus wants to be a friend to every single person. Flo asked me to do a, a, a talk on evangelization, and perhaps it seems a funny place to start. But I think we've got to start at our personal relationship with, with Jesus. Because if we don't know Jesus, if we don't know the risen Jesus... If, he isn't, if there isn't a genuine relationship between ourselves and Jesus, how on earth are we going to be able to communicate the love of Jesus to other people if we ourselves have not experienced that same love? If we don't know Jesus who died and is risen from the dead, if we don't know him personally, how are we going to tell anybody else about him? How are we, how are we going to inform them about him? How are we going to draw them into that relationship with, with Jesus? In the, the Joy of the Gospel, Pope Francis says, while painfully aware of our own frailties, we have to march on without giving in, keeping in mind what the Lord said to St. Paul, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weak, weakness. Christian triumph is always a cross, yet a cross which is at the same time a victorious banner borne with aggressive tenderness against the assaults of evil. So we have to recognize our frailty in with regard to evangelization but knowing that we're walking with jesus and he's walking at our side just like those apostles on the road to emmaus we have jesus walking at our side and he will strengthen us he will guide us he will give us everything that we know now to the talk that i want to give you tonight the, the title of the talk is i called you by your name you are mine and you probably know very well that that is from isaiah chapter 43 but now thus says the Lord, he who created you, O Jacob, he who formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by your name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through fire, you shall not be burned and the flame shall not consume you. For I am the Lord, your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. So that's the, that's the title of the talk. And now I'll go into the main part of the talk. If I sound, if I, if I come from strange angles, I apologize, but st bear with me, stick with me. I want to begin with a, with a poem, if I may, um, from the, um, it's the um, Old Possum's Book of Practical Cats by T.S. Eliot. And it's one of my favorite poems. And if you've seen the, you, you know, the, um, the musical Cats, then you'll, you'll, you'll recognize it. The naming of cats is a difficult matter. It isn't just one of your holiday games. You may think at first I'm as mad as a hatter when I tell you a cat must have three different names. First of all, there's the name that the family use daily, such as Peter, Augustus, Alonzo or James, such as Victor or Jonathan, George or Bill Bailey, all of them sensible everyday names. There are fancier names if you think they sound sweeter, some for the gentlemen and some for the dames such as Plato, Admetus, Electra, Demeter, but all of them sensible everyday names. But I tell you, a cat needs a name that's particular, a name that's peculiar and more dignified, else how can he keep up his tail perpendicular or spread out his whiskers or cherish his pride? Of names of this kind, I can give you a quorum, such as Munkerstrap, Quatso, Coriocopat, such as Bombalorina or Gelilorum, Names that never belong to more than one cat. But above and beyond, there's still one name left over. And that is the name you never will guess. 
the name that no human research can discover, but the cat himself knows and will never confess. When you notice a cat in profound meditation, the reason I tell you is always the same. His mind is engaged in rapt contemplation of the thought, of the thought, of the thought of his name is ineffable, effable, effing ineffable, deep and inscrutable singular name. So what's in a name? Let me give you a quick run through as to what Mackenzie's Dictionary of the Bible has to say. And I quote, it is a widespread cultural phenomenon that the name is considered to be more than an artificial tag which distinguishes one person from another. The name has a mysterious identity with its bearer. It can be considered as a substitute for the person as acting or receiving in his place. The name is often meaningful. It not only distinguishes the person, but it is thought to tell something of the kind of person he is. In magic rites, the name is extremely important. Knowledge of the name gives control. An utterance of the name is effective either upon its bearer or as containing the power of the person whose name is uttered. Vestiges of such beliefs survive even in civilized societies when they retain ancient customs which surround the conferring of the name with solemnity. Many of these beliefs occur in the Bible, and where the name of the deity is concerned, the conception of the name becomes a theological idea. So, what's in a name? It's not only cats that have many names, so do we, and many persona to go with them. Many masks, because that's the real meaning of of persona, the mask that an actor wore in Greek and Roman theatre. And then there are nicknames. Nicknames. I don't really know whether or not I like nicknames, but I suppose we all have nicknames for each other. Some of them are complimentary, some self-explanatory, others a little bit more abstruse, and some are downright rude. I might have a nickname for many people I meet in the diocese. Um, I might, I'm not saying I do. Um, And I wouldn't be surprised if others have nicknames for me. The trouble with nicknames is that they tend to oversimplify and generalize and try to fit people into little boxes, which in the end, they actually don't fit into. When I was at school, I had a nickname uh, and I didn't really like it. In fact, I can honestly say I hated the nickname that I was given. Um, With a name like Drainy, um, you can imagine there are all sorts of puns that people can use very easily. And I'm not sure whether I really want to tell you, but I know you're a very um, confidential group of people. So whatever I say, you won't spread around. So I'll let you know what my nickname was. It was drip, drippy drainy. And drip had a particular character, a particular way of acting and doing things. People had expectations of drip. The terrible thing was that I began to grow into all those things. And I'm not sure whether drip described the person I was or whether drainy grew into the persona of drip. It was like being in prison in my own personality. At the age of 14 or 15, it was really traumatic. I could feel myself being molded into something that I was not and didn't want to be. It was like forcing a a square peg into a round hole. After I'd been ordained a priest, it was a great moment because it was a fresh start for me. No one knew who I was. I was in a new parish. It was a long way from where I came from and I was an unknown quantity. Again, I liked that. No one could label me. However, I was very young and my lack of years uh, was even more evident because my parish priest was an older man. So everyone thought that they got a nice young curate and everything that that goes with that idea. I was expected to be very trendy, very liberal, terribly easygoing and especially good with the youth of the parish. No matter what I said, it made no difference. This was how people had decided I was, and they were not going to take no for an answer. And in the town where the parish was, there was a a youth club um, that all the churches had had set up. 
Um, I was the youngest clergyman in the town by at least 50 years. So it fell to me, that nice young priest who loves working with, with the youth to take over the running of the place three nights a week. To say I hated it was an understatement. It was there in the smelly fetid pubescent atmosphere of the town youth club that I got my next nickname. Here it comes, the Rev Tez. How I detested that name. Once more by the power of the name, I was being transmogrified. I was no more Rev Tez than I'd ever been drippy drainy. I was once more imprisoned by the nickname of being forced to live a false existence. It brought with it frustration, anger, panic, and terrible insecurity. It was at this time that I rediscovered something that kept me going through a bad patch in my late teens. I'd been reading my Bible one day, and up, up popped a piece of uh, scripture that hit me in the face. And as soon as I read it, I knew that it was for me. It had been written with just me in mind. This is it. If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not withhold his own son, but gave him up for us all, will he not with him also give us everything else? Who will bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies, who is to condemn? It is Christ Jesus who died, yes, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed intercedes for us. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will hardship or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? No, in all these things, we are far more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, no angels, no rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. That's from Romans chapter 8, verses 31 to 39. Unlike my nickname, the sound of these words brought me real peace, joy, hope and courage, which I knew I personally lacked. I knew that all these things came from a source outside myself and I was being offered them freely and with no strings attached. Another phrase too came back very closely connected with this one. As a teenager, I'd felt very insecure and lacked confidence in so many ways. The same was true of my time in seminary. There seemed to be so many things I had to face for which I did not have the courage, nor the skills, nor the desire. So many things held fear for me. As I said, I went to the university, I went to the seminary in Spain and I attended the Spanish university. So speaking Spanish, having to mix with other students, study, study exams, house jobs, they made, they made me the choir master in the college where I was. And all I could play was the recorder. The guy before me had played in the National Youth Orchestra and the one before him was a member of the Royal College of Organists. And they were both still in the college and here was I, just about proficient on a tin whistle and they've made me the choir master. So what was this other phrase? What was this other piece of scripture that I found? Here it is. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Whom shall I be afraid? Though an army encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war rise up against me, yet I will be confident. One thing I asked of the Lord, this will I seek, to live in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord, to inquire in his temple. Teach me your way, O Lord, and lead me on a level path because of my enemies. Do not give me up to the will of my adversaries, for false witnesses rise against me, and they are breathing out violence. I believe that I shall see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and let your heart take courage. Wait for the Lord. When I heard this, I knew it to be true. By sheer intuition, by sheer desperation, I could fumble my way through most things, and more than fumble. I could approach life with confidence. Thanks be to God, because those words inspired me. 
When you hear other people's nicknames, they can be a great source of laughter and mirth. In Africa, they had names for everyone. I forgot to tell you too, I spent some time out in Kenya. I was six years in, uh, in Western Kenya, uh, just outside the, the town of Kisumu. And the people there had names for everybody. And my name was Omondi, which um, really meant the one who was always there very early in the morning. Whenever people arrived, I would be there. But it also had another connotation as well. It basically meant that I was so nosy, I was so eager to find out what was going on that I couldn't stay in bed. As soon as the sun was up, I would be out to find out what was going on. In other words, I was a bit of a nosy parker. The people with whom I, I lived and worked in Kenya also believed that you had a mystical name, a name which only God knew. And that's how he called you into existence and that's how we will call you back to him at the end of your days. No one else knows this name. If they did, they could have complete power over you. There were lots of folk stories about demons trying to trick God into revealing people's name so that they could control them. Now, I think that the folks I was with in Africa are right, because I also believe that we have a mystical name that's known only to God. God speaks my name and I am, I exist. It's a name which expresses exactly who I am and what I'm about. Those phrases that I, I just shared with you, with God on our side, who can be against us? Nothing therefore can come between us and the love of Christ. And the Lord is my light and my salvation, whom shall I fear? The Lord is the fortress of my life, of whom should I be afraid? Those phrases have brought about great transformation great moments of conversion and intimacy in my life. They're probably the most important things that I've ever heard so far. Without having heard them, I would not be here, I don't think. They are all to do with the way God calls my name. And somewhere in all that is my real name, the name by which God knows me and loves me. Somewhere in all that is the real me that I'm still discovering. To you, it may sound very, uh, it, may, it may not sound very much, but somewhere in all that is the real definition of the person that I am. If we were to look at the life of Jesus in these terms, perhaps there's one phrase which sums up everything that Jesus is and was called to be. And that phrase, that word is simply Abba. I know that we too say Abba. But when Jesus says Abba, it's something very personal and absolutely unique. None of us can say that word in the same way as Jesus. For him, it has a singular meaning. It is the basis of his very existence and mission. And in a less dramatic yet similar way, those scripture phrases of mine are unique to me and have singular meaning for me and sum up also the very basis of my existence and my mission. Without putting too fine a point on it, I think, I believe that mixed in with those words is my being called into existence. That the moment God created me and called me by my name, those words became part and parcel of my being too. At least through these words, my spirit is able to recall and recognize my first being called by God. Objectively speaking, no one no call comes from God to anyone except in the person of Jesus. And no one makes a response to God except in the person of Christ Jesus. And so this calling me into being, speaking my name and my first moments of existence can only be in Christ Jesus. In fact, this is really what baptism is about. To be baptized in Christ Jesus is to be plunged into Christ Jesus. This is how we put on or are clothed in Christ Jesus in, un, in an unrepeatable and singular way. The father who glories in the image of his son sees reflected in us the face of his son. And the father says, you are my beloved son. You are my beloved daughter and I delight in you. Having heard this, it's our job to begin to live it out in a personal way recognizing that it is really me to whom the Father is speaking in Christ Jesus. 
This knowledge is not just important for me, rather without it, I'm lost, I'm adrift, I'm in chaos. This calling is issued to me at my creation and baptism and confirmation is the basis of everything else. It is this calling which gives life and spirit to all my other callings. It is a calling in the order of being. This calling is not a summoning to do something, rather it's a calling me into being. And it's from my being that my doing flows and not vice versa. If I didn't really understand this and try to, li try to live it out, then God knows I would find any real meaning in my life at all. You see, I think every one of us has a mystical name, one by which God calls us. Well, that's not new, I suppose, is it? Didn't I quote from Mackenzie's dictionary at the very beginning um, that most primitive peoples believe this? Yes, I did. But the thing that I'd also believe is that God wants you and me to know this name. And he's always trying to reveal it to us in prayer and especially when we read the scriptures. I'm sure that it's not just me, but when we read the scriptures, phrases leap off the page and begin to speak to our heart. They say things to us which go beyond the actual meaning of the words on the paper. They say things to us so deep that we cannot really explain them to other people. They say things to us that make us realize that God knows us as we really are. And in him, we can truly begin the pilgrimage of knowing ourselves. If you already know your name, that is the name by which God calls you, then guard it, keep it close to you, repeat it frequently, because it's the key to the present and the future. In the light of this knowledge, you can live out present storms and crises in peace and equilibrium. With this knowledge, you can face all the fears and apprehensions that the future might hold. With this knowledge, you can do whatever is asked of you. You can cope with any situation because deep down in the very core of your being, you know who you are, for God has told you by calling your name. Everything in your life will flow from this, will be permeated by it. Whatever vocation comes next, it will be inspired and directed by your original vocation, your first calling, the moment when God called you by your name. Let me just read again the two passages um, in and through which I think God is calling me by name. Somewhere in all this is the real me. I hope you've understood what I've been trying to say to you this evening. I know it's a bit complicated and perhaps I come at it from a, from a strange angle and I'm sorry about that. But take it from me that you will know your name if you listen to the Lord speaking to you in prayer and particularly as you pray through scripture. And this is what I think God is calling me. The Lord is my light and my help. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Though an army encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war rise up against me, yet will I be confident. One thing I ask of the Lord, this I will seek, to live in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord, to inquire in his temple. I believe I shall see the Lord's goodness in the land of the living. Wait for him, be strong, let your heart take courage, Wait for the Lord. That's Psalm 27. And then from Romans chapter 8. If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not withhold his own son, but gave him up for us all, will he not with him also give us everything else? Who will bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? It is Christ Jesus who died. Yes, he was raised who is at the right hand of God and who intercedes for us? Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will hardship or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, nor angel, 
nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus, our Lord. That's my offering to you tonight. And perhaps the question I ask you as, as we finish is, when you read scripture, have you found pieces of scripture which somehow burn your heart, which somehow you make you realize that in the, those pieces of scripture, God is calling you by your name. Your name is somewhere, who you are is somewhere in those scripture passages. Have you discovered that? I hope you have. And if not, I hope that soon in the future, you'll begin to discover what name God is calling you by and what, what he's calling you to. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for that talk, Bishop Terry. I think there was a lot, there was a lot to take in with that talk, with the references. Yeah, lots to think about. Yeah, um, I need to get back to my Bible and get reading. <laughs> but um, yeah, I thought it was fantastic, thoroughly fantastic. Um, there was a lot in there to grasp. And I think that's why it's, it, that's why it's useful. That's on our it's on our YouTube, so people can go back and listen to the talk and just go through what you've said individually and just take it in. Um, perhaps read scriptures every day and stuff, and just just to pray to God and find out what they're actual what God is actually calling them by. Well, if you remember, Saint Jerome tells us that ignorance of the scriptures is ignorance of Christ. If we're not going to read the scriptures, we're never really going to come to know the Lord. If we're not going to read the scriptures, we're never going to come to know what the Lord wants us to do. You know, people scratch their head and say, what does God, you know, what does God want to say to me? What does, what does God, what, what is God calling me to do in life? Well, it's actually all there. It's all there. Pick it up and begin to read it and allow the Lord to speak to your heart. And as he speaks to your heart, you'll begin to understand. Um, while you read it, it can I, if, I, if I could do another advert while I'm at it, um, as well as the Bible, this book I have found, it's, 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 I don't know if it's still in, in publication, but it's a really fantastic book about personal vocation. And it's also um, meditations on the, um, the spiritual exercises of St. Ignatius. And it's published by the Gregorian University by a man called, a priest called Herbert Alfonso, who is now dead. Um, but it's a really, really good book. And what's even better about it, as you can see, it's not very big either. So it's, it's possible to, to, to get it and to read it. Uh, what's so the I title of that book? We couldn't quite read it up through the screen. Oh, it's called The Personal Vocation. And it's by Father Herbert Alfonso SJ. And it's actually published by the Gregorian University. But I, I went on there. Uh, I went on Amazon a few weeks ago and you can get secondhand copies of it reasonably, reasonably easy. And it's a really, really good book. And as I say, what really sells it to me, it's not very big, it's not very thick. <laughs> yeah, accessible, definitely. Very, very. I thought it was nice, the point you made at the beginning um, about, you know, in order to bring Christ to others, we really need to have a, a living relationship with him ourselves and, and know our Lord before, in order to, transmit Christ to those around us um, yeah because of course the the nature of um, being a Catholic is that we want to bring Christ to others but yeah we have to know him very well ourselves that there is a temptation at times you know to to, 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 to first of all grab hold of the catechism uh, and and to go around and push the catechism underneath everybody's noses now we have to come to the catechism, but before you before you can come to the catechism to a certain extent, you have to come to know Christ Jesus as a living person, because that's that the whole point of the catechism is to bring us to to the knowledge of Jesus Christ and to to find the good news. And our good news, as we know, is a person. It's not a it's not a set of uh, propositions. It's a person, Jesus Christ, and we have to come to know and love Him. And, and, and we do that principally uh, through prayer and through the scriptures. Wonderful, thank you so much for this. I've got a question, Father. Yeah. I've got a question, Father. 
in, in um when it comes to bible obviously um i think some students will struggle will struggle to cause the bible is quite thick and um i guess what i'm asking is what is the right way to read a, the bible where would you start from do you have to start from the beginning from you, you know old testament or right bang in the middle with um the new testament what's your advice for students that haven't really read the bible before haven't picked up the bible what how what would your advice be to them well a, a simple thing is um well first of all you, you can get lots of little books and little commentaries on the scriptures you know and lots of books that will give you a little piece of scripture uh, for each day and then give you a little bit of an explanation of the scripture and then perhaps a little prayer i don't know if you've heard of magnificat um there's a publication called magnificat which is a um, a really good uh, publication. It contains the scripture of the day, a little uh, little thought on the scripture of the day. It also contains morning prayer, evening prayer, and the 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 um, the readings for the mass and the prayers for the mass. So it's a really good uh, little book to get hold of. But there's lots and lots of little commentaries. Um, that yeah, we'll... I pray with the gospel is another really good one. That's an app as well. It's a free app, yeah. um, and. Uh, yeah, it's that it's that kind of a layer. It has like a, um, it has the gospel of the day, but you know, like a short passage from the gospel of the day, and then a commentary. And it's I, the I pray is particularly nice because it's often got like um, quite practical stories and things relating to the gospel. So you can see like how does how can this be applied to my life, and like how can I apply this to my day to day life. Mm. um so that's like a really good way to access it because i would agree flow like if you just like, hand somebody the bible it's like where do you begin um but yeah those kind of resources are so helpful and and very often there's a little bible group and if there isn't a bible group in your chaplaincy or at you in your university you ought to speak to the chaplain and say you know it's about time we had a little bit of a bible group get together uh, just once a week and have a just have a have a session and pray together over the scriptures and see what the see what the Lord is saying to us as as as, um, as a group of people. Lexio Divina is uh, which is the you know the the reading of the the Bible in a prayerful uh, in a prayerful way is is an excellent way of accessing the the scriptures and doing it together is a very encouraging way because sometimes when you're left on your own it's a bit hard work you know but when there's a group of you um, coming together. Uh, you, you're encouraged and helped, you know, and, and also if if there's a group of you, maybe the Lord is speaking through that person over there, actually speaking to you through that person, you know, and uh, and and very often you can you can become really encouraged and helped uh, with the scriptures through a Alexio Divina group or a Bible study group, but the scriptures are absolutely fundamental, absolutely fundamental. I don't know how you can pray without the scriptures, to be honest. I really don't. Um, and and I, I, do, I do recommend that whenever you pray, the scriptures should be at the side of you. I always, I always say, have, have the scripture at the side of you and a little notebook so that when you're distracted... Mm. Oh. Mm. Yeah, don't know what's happened here. Sorry about that. Somebody was trying to ring me up and it interfered with the, um, I'm on a, a, a Mac, MacBook Air, so the, that's what happened there. Sorry about that. So I always recommend that you have a, you have a, um, the, the scriptures next to you and a little notepad so that if you're distracted, you know, if you suddenly think, oh, I've got to, got to go to the shops and buy some milk, write it down so it doesn't distract you anymore. And then you can carry on, you can carry on praying and carry on listening to what the Lord is saying to you in the scriptures. So a very practical way of praying. Yes, uh, I don't think we have any other questions in the in the live chat, but uh, we've had uh, about ten people joining, which is fantastic. Thank you to everyone who's who's been listening. Um, I don't have any more questions. Thank you for me. Thank you for coming on Zoom. Um, a brilliant way to. Again, another amazing talk. We had another talk two weeks ago. Brilliant. This is another incredible talk. And I think the fact that we've had no questions, I think people are starting to think about it now. Well, I did, yeah. warn, you that, I did warn you that the sort of talk I was giving isn't sort of like a, 
uh, an intellectual thing. It's it, the things you've got to go away and question yourself about, aren't you? Yeah. Um, well, and, 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 and do it, you know. Uh, prayer is praying with the scriptures, that's where you start, and, 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 and listen to the Lord, give Him time, um, allow Him to speak to you. So, some silence in your prayer as well is so important, otherwise, how would the Lord be able to speak to you, you know? Okay. We've got to give the Lord a chance to get a word in edgeways now and again. Yeah. Anyway, great, great to be with you. And, and, Thank and, you so uh, much. Thank you for coming. Thank you. And God bless. Thank God you for bless. everyone for joining us today.